It's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Troubleshooter125, who says... Steve, as bad as the 2012 Republican clown car was four years ago, it only seems to have gotten worse with the passage of time, and the head creep behind the wheel of that car right now is pretty obviously Donald Trump. He may be the apotheosis of flash versus substance, and about as suited for the presidency as I would be, yet his following is strong and growing, a fact I find immensely disturbing. So my question is simple. What do you think it will take to put a stop to him? Something needs to happen where the, the Republican Party in general, and I don't just mean the party leadership and the politicians, but the voters as well, really need to have a come-to-Jesus moment about this upcoming election. They need to have a moment of clarity where they really decide, are we going to nominate Donald Trump to be our party's candidate in the general election. And whenever that happens, I don't know what the catalyst will be. I don't know if it will be one of the upcoming debates, because Christ, there's going to be enough of them, or his numbers slipping in the polls, or him saying something uh, outrageous during a campaign event. Although, given what he's already said, I can't really think what that might be. Like, What else could he possibly say that he hasn't already said that would be the straw that broke the camel's back? I don't know. Um, but something like that is going to happen between now and the end of the primaries next year. And the Republicans are going to have to say, okay, is this really what we're going to do? Are we really going to go to the convention and then beyond to the general election with this guy at the top of our ticket? And obviously, the correct answer is no, they can't do that. If they care about being a respectable party in the future, if they care about winning this next election, they can't do that. Most of all, if they care about the future and the well-being of this country, they cannot elect Donald Trump as the president. And if they do, if, if they nominate him, then I fear for them that it will be a major blow to the credibility of their party, and if by some insane act of national political social suicide Donald Trump is elected president, it would be a terrible thing for the country as a whole and for the rest of the world. So there, there's going to have to be some kind of a cold water in the face, come to Jesus moment where the Republicans snap out of it and say, holy shit, this can't, this, is, this can't happen. We can't do this to ourselves and we can't do this to the rest of the world. But as to what will, will happen, what it will take to shake them out of that, I have no idea. Because just Trump being Trump so far doesn't seem to have been enough. Tara Nelson, question. Steve, I recently had an exchange with a radical feminist, and she seemed to embody every stereotype that MRAs claim about feminists in general. I thought, boy, if I didn't already know that this is not what the majority of feminists believe or behave like, I would probably believe what MRAs say about feminists. Do you think that the feminist movement at large does enough to distance themselves from such radicals or enough to get the message of mainstream feminism out there to counter the radical voices? Do you think that the majority of MRA supporters are being willfully blind to the more moderate voices or are the radical voices so loud and outrageous that they honestly believe that the radicals' views are what feminists actually believe? If the latter is true, what can we do as feminists to improve the public perception of feminism? I think a lot of what is happening as far as how anti-feminists uh, perceive feminism as being defined by radicals and outrageous man-hating people, I think a lot of that is due to the fact that they get most of their information about feminism from people who hate feminism and who have a vested interest in mischaracterizing it and demonizing it and putting forward this narrative that feminism as a whole is just a bunch of angry, man-hating women uh, who favor, you know, uh, female supremacy rather than true gender equality. I think a lot of it is that. It's the same reason why there are so many religious folks who are absolutely convinced that the theory of evolution is utter nonsense and scientifically unsupported and just, you know, any day now it's going to be completely turned over and refuted and science is going to have to admit that they knew that creation was the truth all along. No one educated on the subject could possibly believe that. That simply does not reflect 
the consensus view of people who know about evolution. And the same thing is true with feminism. The, the feminist movement is seen as a positive and necessary movement overwhelmingly by people who are sociologically uh, educated and fluent. Um, and the idea that, that feminism is this, is this hate group uh, is, is held by a, a tiny but vocal minority. And most of the people who are convinced that all feminists are these angry, man-hating radicals, they, they get their information from people who are intending to push that narrative. Now, uh, as for what, what can feminists do, or do feminists do enough to distance themselves from the radicals and the extremists that do exist within the very large and diverse community of feminists? Um, I think they do. I think the, the, the uh, identity of being a TERF, a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, is relatively infamous. I mean, the only, pretty much the only people who, who like TERFs are other TERFs. Most uh, feminists outside of that small group find them to be embarrassing and uh, would like to put as much distance between them and the rest of feminism as possible. So uh, feminism being a diverse group uh, is actually pretty good, I think, at identifying problematic uh, areas of its own community and, I, and, and sort of drawing a circle around them and going, okay, they don't get any attention. They're going to be pushed off to the side and the rest of us are going to try to do things that are more positive and productive. So I think feminism is pretty good at that. The Nightmare Rider. Here's a question for you, Steve. Why do you think the cultural taboo and deep anxieties over nudity persist in our culture, as well as countless others. I'm not questioning the necessity or practicality of clothing, but rather why so many people, even those that see gymnophobia as a very irrational discomfort, wouldn't dream of appearing nude in front of anyone but their most trusted partners, even if it was somewhere like a nudist environment where the human body is guaranteed to be accepted free from ridicule. This has never made sense to me, but I would like to hear you examine this idea. It doesn't make sense to me either, but that is exactly how I feel. I would never want to appear naked in front of anyone other than my wife. Or like a doctor if that was absolutely necessary. Like I'm the type of person that if I, if I were to go to a doctor's appointment and he was like, okay, take your clothes off, I would be like, is that really necessary? Like what part are you going to look at? Can I just go like this? You know, I just, and I think it's just conditioning. It's just cultural conditioning. Many of us, I guess most of us, given the overall feeling that seems to pervade in our culture about nudity, we're just conditioned from very young age to consider nudity to be an incredibly private thing and that you should be clothed. Like, whenever there's the chance that people's eyes are going to be on you, you should have clothes on. It's just... It's just a choice that our culture made. Um, maybe it has to do with... with uh, associating modesty with sexual propriety. Maybe we, we connect the idea of going around and being naked with the idea of being promiscuous or hedonistic, and we want to discourage that. Maybe there's something about our prudishness uh, that, you know, our, our, the, how uptight we are about certain things in this culture. I mean, because Americans are very loose and very relaxed and very blasé about a lot of things. But there are also some things that we are incredibly neurotic about. And I think nudity is one of those things. I mean, look at how we treat nudity in movies, where you can get an R rating or an NC-17 rating in a movie much easier if you have uh, extensive nudity or like graphic sexual content. But not for excessive violence. Like, if you want to get a movie rated NC-17 for violent content, that's got to be a violent, violent motherfucking movie. But if you show people having sex in a somewhat realistically depicted manner, or you show a woman naked top and bottom, ooh, get ready for that NC-17. So we have a very prudish outlook on it, and I'm not sure exactly what is the cause of it, but it's it's definitely very deeply rooted in our culture because I know I was definitely raised with it. Joe McClory, in regards to your stalemating social justice video you did on your ramble on Monday, do you think that the attacks on Planned Parenthood and many state laws that seem to be targeted at reducing access to legal abortion to be examples of that sort of mindset 
Or do you think that they are in fact meant as stepping stones on the path to making it impossible or so impractical that it may as well be impossible to get a legal abortion? Also on that topic, I can't help but think that if the goal is to protect and help unborn children, that attacks on Planned Parenthood in particular are counterproductive at best, seeing as much of what they do is help women bring healthy babies to term and help address reproductive health so a woman will not lose the ability to have children in the future. I've not looked at the numbers, but I would be surprised if Planned Parenthood does not save more pregnancies than it ends. I cannot help but wonder if the move is more about punishing women, particularly poor women, they think are morally deficient, than it is about saving babies. Your thoughts? I actually am even more cynical about it than that. I think the main reason behind the attacks on Planned Parenthood in particular and abortion in general are uh, motivated by the fact that they know that it is a very effective political wedge issue. They know that they can appeal to people who are very against abortion in a very emotional way, often because uh, they, they object to it on religious grounds. Politicians who focus on abortion as a cause, uh, anti-abortion as a cause, know that that is going to rile people up. And that is going to inspire people to get out and vote. That is a very emotional, very highly charged issue. And it always works to energize the base. If you have a very conservative, very uh, uh, right-wing religious base and you run on being against abortion, that's a really strong, really uh, proven strategy. So I think that's the main thing. Uh, and the other things you mentioned, like punishing women, they don't care about that. They're willing to do that. I don't think they, they care about women's health if they did then they would not be so determined to destroy what is arguably the most prominent and important women's health organization in the country. So clearly that is part of it, but I don't think that's the primary motivation. The primary motivation, I think, is the fact that it's just politically effective. It's, it's political dynamite. They know it's going to work with a certain segment of the voters every time. Um, as for the first part of your question, do I think that this is part of the, the stalemating strategy that I talked about in that other video? I kind of do. Um, I think that the, the battle against abortion has reached a point where they have pretty much exhausted all of their legal battles to try and overturn it. Uh, people like me who support abortion like to state our support in uh, three ways. We believe that abortion should be legal, it should be safe, and it should be available. Now, no one in their right mind who has any eye toward their political future is going to attack abortion by trying to make it less safe. So we'll take that off the table right away. Um, it's going to be legal because the Supreme Court has declared it to be legal and Roe versus Wade has withstood challenges for 40 years. So they're not going to be able to make it illegal, at least not across the board at the national level. So the only one they have left is availability. So they will attack the availability of abortions. They will uh, they will enact onerous restrictions to try and force abortion clinics to close. They will try to make abortions as expensive as they possibly can. They will stand in the way of federal funding for abortions. They will do anything they can to make it as difficult and as expensive as possible for women to get abortions while leaving abortion, technically speaking, a legal procedure that anyone who needs can get. And in a sense, that is a stalemating strategy because they're not trying to overturn the law. They're not trying to render abortion illegal, although they would love to do that if that were politically feasible. But since that's not politically feasible, they're going with the strategy of trying to make it as difficult to access as possible, erecting as many barriers as they can between women who want abortions and getting those abortions. The fluke man. Question. Many atheists like to state that the world would be a better place if religion never existed. Do you also find this to be true? I feel religion is something that has actually beneficial and even necessary for the cultural evolution of mankind. It fueled the rise of civilization. Heck, even the printing press was invented in order to make Bibles available to a lot more people. However, I also feel religion in today's time is obsolete and became so somewhere in the middle of the Renaissance. Maybe atheists should chill out a bit and see religion as historically benefiting today's rational thinking. For example, if we look at alchemy from today's perspective, it seems irrational, silly, stupid, and obsolete. 
However, we should ask ourselves if chemistry and medicine would be as advanced today if the way to them wasn't paved early on by such a pseudoscience. What are your thoughts? I think the comparison of um, religion and alchemy is right on. I would also say you can make a similar comparison between astronomy and astrology. And I think it's, it's just a phase we pass through in our cultural and our intellectual evolution. And I think you're absolutely right to look at religion the same way. Yes, we can easily point to all the bad things about religion. We can point to the Inquisition. We can point to the, uh, uh, the oppression of women and the oppression of gay people and the exacerbation of our tribal instincts and all the wars fought and all the death and destruction wrought over disagreements over completely meaningless doctrinal issues. We can point to all the, the really awful negative things that religion has done. But, yeah, you also have to <laughs> reckon with the fact that the same institutions responsible for those evils are also responsible for the most amazing art and architecture and music and literature in most of the history of Western civilization. Um, and you can't just say, well, we would be better off if we, if we never had it, because yes, we would have missed out on a lot of that evil stuff, but we also would have missed out on all the good stuff, the ennobling stuff, the stuff that we can look back on and say, these are high points in our culture. And it's not necessarily fair to credit religion with that, because as I've said before, you know, if, I'm, if you're an atheist, you believe all religions are false, then religions are man-made. So religion didn't give us anything. Religion may have focused us and, and allowed us to marshal resources or given us certain motivations, uh, allowed us to set certain goals for ourselves to meet, but uh, religion is not something that just sort of popped up on its own and then made us do all these things. We did all these things ourselves. We just did it under an umbrella of religious belief, religious thought, religious institutions. Um, and yeah, you, it's, it's way too simplistic. Religion is ingrained in the evolution of our society, and we can't just rip it out without ripping out a whole bunch of other stuff that we would not want to lose. But you're right. It, we, we have, I think, grown past the need for it. Uh, as at, least, at least the need for it as anything other than a comforting ceremony that maybe we return to every once in a while to feel like we're in touch with our past or in touch with our roots or our traditions. Um, but in terms of anything that helps us to understand the world or understand the universe, uh, we have far better tools for those sorts of things than religion. We don't need it for that anymore, and, and I don't think we should use it for that. Alba Gaga. Question, Steve, do you see atheists as a persecuted minority in need of representation to redress the balance with Christians and other religions? And if so, is that a struggle American atheists have to deal with? I ask because as a Briton and a fan of your videos, I sometimes wonder if there are American atheists who have to hide their beliefs for fear of discrimination. It certainly seems that no politician can get elected without Jesus on their shoulder, but what about the ordinary Joe? Also, I wonder if you have any opinion on the British national treasurer Stephen Fry as a comedian, an openly gay man, and an outspoken atheist. Well, first of all, I'm a huge admirer of Stephen Fry. I think he's just intimidatingly intelligent and an incredibly funny, warm, compassionate, humane sort of guy. I think he's terrific. Um, and yes, unfortunately, I think there is, there is still a lot of discrimination against atheists in the United States. It's really hard, I think much harder than on the adults. It's very hard on young people. If you are a child or a teenager and you realize that, that you're an atheist, and you, especially if you come from a religious family and you, you realize that you have rejected the religion of your parents and your grandparents, that can be a very, very vulnerable position. And uh, one of the great atheist organizations is uh, Recovering from Religion, run by Sarah Moorhead. And they actually have a hotline that people can call. You can, they have an anonymous hotline that you can call if you are a person, especially a young person, uh, who is struggling with being an atheist in a hostile environment. And this is something that is, that is very desperately needed and uh, something that a lot of young people who are atheists but fear what would happen to them if their parents found out about it really need. Uh, so those are the people I worry about. Uh, there are, there, I hear from grown-ups all the time, people my age and even older, who have situations where they don't want people to find out that they're atheists, or, or at least that they feel their lives are just much easier if they keep it to themselves. But the people who are really vulnerable are, are young people, are, are children and teenagers, 
who are absolutely terrified that if their parents find out that they're atheists that they they will they won't have a place to live or that they'll completely lose the relationship and the love and the respect that they have with their parents um, that's something that happens unfortunately it seems to happen enough that it's a problem that we need to address so that's that's something I always worry about when people ask are atheists really that marginalized or are, are atheists really that oppressed as a group the young people in many cases are unfortunately why do I always have to end the main segment on such a heavy question it makes me seem like such a callous asshole to give a really serious thoughtful answer to a, a very important question and then follow it up with saying it's time for the lightning round rapid fire questions glib and adequate answers Der Wunderbar Bar, if you were to be of any alien species from either movies or TV shows, which would you be? Myself, I would probably be a Klingon, Star Trek, or perhaps a Luxan, Farscape. Oh, if I could be any alien from a TV or movie. Um, yeah, probably a Klingon. Klingons are cool. You know, and I, you know what? I could, instead of being a warrior, I could be like a Klingon scientist or a Klingon librarian or something. Or a Klingon poet. Instead of going out and killing people, I could write about how wonderful it is to kill people. That would be my role in Klingon society. Ezra Henderson. Hey, Steve, do you have any nicknames that you go by, like Stevie, Steve-O, Stevenstein, Shiveszilla? If so, would you tell us, viewers? It's Shivezilla. No, actually, um, I just go by Steve. My grandfather used to call me Steve-O every once in a while, but it's nothing that I go by, and it's certainly not anything that I invite others to call me. You can just call me Steve. Patrick Dodds, Steve, see, just like that. What do you think of Sidney Lumet's network and Oliver Stone's Nixon? I'm wincing because I'm fearing negative reviews. Personally, they're two of my favorite films. Um, no, I don't, I don't worry about any negative reviews for me. I wouldn't say they're two of my favorite films, but I admire both films. And I especially remember uh, seeing Nixon and being surprised by how good it was because a lot of the reviews have been kind of negative, but I actually thought Nixon was terrific. Uh, net, and, you know, Network is a classic. So, yeah, top marks for both for me. Yaro Kassir. Hey, Steve, you've talked before numerous times in your channel and in your episode with Seth Andrews on The Thinking Atheist about apologetics tropes. Have you ever considered writing a formal list of these tropes for amusing yourself and viewers? I think the one I love to hate the most has to be the I used to be an atheist trope or variants thereof. Yeah, that's a great idea. Actually, if I ever get to the point where I am being invited to give talks at conferences, like a real big shot, I'm pretty sure that will be the topic of one of my talks. I think that is something that I'm, I'm fairly well qualified to, to offer an opinion on. I think I have enough expertise in it by now after having read and dissected so many apologetics books. Um, the, the common tropes of apologists, I think, would be a really great subject for a talk. Brian Gibson, have you heard about September 23rd? Will this finally be the correct end time prediction? Well, I'm actually shooting this video on September 23rd and it's uh, 8 p.m. my time and the world has not ended yet, so I think we're looking good. But if the world is over by the time you watch this video on Friday, we'll know for sure. Radical Bacon, what would you do if you got to meet Jason with a D in real life? Would you hug him? for starters. <laughs> Actually, at this moment, if I met him in person, I would take him outside and we would scare the shit out of these fucking obnoxious kids right outside. That would be a lot of fun to do with Jason with a D in real life. And then we'd high five. Maybe kiss. Um, Sabrina Loazides Meredith. Hey, Steve, are you going to do your horror movie series again this year? I loved the zombie one last year. And if you're going to do another one, what will you pick? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do another one. And I, I was actually talking with Ashley about it the other day. She suggested that maybe I should do creature features. Uh, so I think that might be the, the topic this year. But I'm definitely going to do another series of, of five, like, Halloween-related movie reviews at the end of October. And I might, be, I might do creature features. That sounds like a fun one. Twee-Sparkle. Lightning round. So when and how did you find out that wrestling was fake? And what happened? How long did you actually think it was real? When and how did the people around you, friends, family, etc., find out it was fake? P.S. Since I am not into wrestling, when did they actually admit they them to they themselves? That, when did they actually admit they themselves were fake? I knew I'd get through it. Um, well, for me personally, I, I guess I realized it was fake around age 
I don't know, nine or ten. I've been a fan for a couple years, and you just sort of catch on. It's like it's like when you realize Santa Claus isn't real. You just sort of it just sort of dawns on you. There wasn't like an aha moment for me. It was just like, oh, oh, I know what this is. But there is actually a slightly more concrete answer to the second part of your question. When did the wrestling business itself admit that it was fake? Um, February 10th, 1989. That is the most commonly quoted date for that happening. That's the date when Vince McMahon, the owner and promoter of the World Wrestling Federation, now World Wrestling Entertainment, testified before a committee of the New Jersey State Senate, uh, who was, which was considering a bill that would have removed pro wrestling from the sports that are subject to the authority of the State Athletic Commission. And, of course, Vince McMahon wanted to get away from the State Athletic Commission because it, it regulates and it limits what you can do, and he wanted to be free from that regulation. So he testified before the committee and admitted that pro wrestling was not a legitimate sport, that it was predetermined, it was, as wrestlers and wrestling fans like to say, a work. So there you go. Everybody kind of knew all along, but it had never been openly admitted. But February 10th, 1989, that's when wrestling was officially outed as not actually a sport. And now you know. Don't you feel smarter? Hey, that's it for the lightning round. Before I get out of here, I'm going to give a shout out to a fellow YouTuber who I feel deserves a little bit of a bump, a little bit of a push. Again, to go back to the wrestling parlance, he deserves to have a rocket strapped to his back and be shot straight to the top. It's the YouTube channel of someone who's actually been doing videos for quite a few years uh, away from YouTube. He had a Blip TV channel that was very popular. And uh, it's the YouTube channel of Folding Ideas, also known as Foldable Human, also known as Dan Olson, uh, has been doing videos for quite a while on Blip TV. Uh, uh, with using the, the 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 puppet character Foldy, and he's uploaded a lot of those videos to his YouTube channel now, and he's also doing new original stuff and uh, trying to build his audience on YouTube. And I would just love to give him a hand with that because I am a huge fan of uh, Folding Ideas. I think it's a great series. It's it's critical analysis basically of of movies of culture. If you really enjoy critical analysis like I do, really digging into things and reading them with an eye to particular themes or particular interpretations. Um, or trying to figure out what the, the deeper implications of a given work or a given part of culture are. Uh, Folding Ideas is a great series. He's, he's done a couple videos on Man of Steel, which speaks directly to me, because he's not a huge fan of Man of Steel either. Uh, he's done a video, he did a video on Gamergate that is absolutely excellent, really getting underneath the, the motivations and what actually happens with Gamergaters when they go on Twitter and harass people and why they're doing it and what they're doing and what it all means. Um, just a really, really great channel, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Folding Ideas on YouTube. Check it out. I cannot recommend it to you highly enough, which I believe I already said. It's close to the end of the video. I'm completely falling apart. Hey, also I want to remind you as always to check out the Lemmy Listen podcasts. You can go to lemmylistenpodcasts.com. These are podcasts created and hosted by the aforementioned Jason Harding. Jason with a D, the guy that I said I would love to beat up kids with and make out with. Uh, for now, I'm going to have to settle for co-hosting a podcast with the dude. Um, we co-host the podcast Late Seating, which is one of the Let Me Listen podcasts where we review notable films and talk about why we like them or don't like them. It's a great show. The most recent episode that we put up last week is Gone with the Wind. If you haven't listened to that, I highly recommend it. I think it's one of our best episodes. He also does uh, Let Me Finish with Finite Atticus, which is a hilarious show. And he does... Uh, the uh, American Monsters and How to Destroy Them podcast, which is a an improv comedy show uh, done in the style of a local radio show. It's kind of a cross between uh, Coast to Coast AM and Twin Peaks, uh, and it's uh, a really, really funny show, and I highly recommend it. LemmeListenPodcasts.com. Check it out. Well, that's it for me, everybody. I am out of here once again. Before I go, please let me remind you to leave a comment on this video asking me your question for next time. You can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious, nothing is too silly, and I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video. So until then, if the world doesn't end, take care everybody.